Hello, and welcome to our webinar, the RAMPC CRISPR Analysis System, an end-to-end -end solution for genome editing quantification. My name is Ashley Jacoby, and I am the manager of R&D strategy at IDP. I will be serving as the moderator for today's presentation. Our speaker is Dr. Gavin Kurgan, who is a bioinformatics scientist at IDT. Dr. Kurgan earned his PhD in biological design from Arizona State University in 2018, working on identifying and optimizing biocatalyst transport systems using cross-disciplinary methods. Since joining IDT in 2018, his research has focused on developing computational methods to optimize the CRISPR-Cas genome editing toolbox. This includes developing methods to better control, identify, and characterize genome editing events to drive precise DNA repair using these systems. To this end, he is the primary developer on the IDT CRISPR NGS analysis pipeline, the RAMPSEQ CRISPR analysis tool. During and following the webinar, please submit your questions using the Got a Question box. Any questions that are not answered during the Q&A session will be followed up with afterwards. And with that, I'll pass it off to Gavin. Thanks for the great introduction, Ashley. Uh, as you said, my name is Gavin Kurgan, and I'm a bioinformatics scientist here at IDT. Uh, today, I'm going to walk you through some work we've been doing to try and streamline genome editing workflows by providing an end-to-end -end solution for CRISPR genome editing analysis. This is something that we've called the RAMPC CRISPR analysis system. So as a quick review, the main enzymes in the genome editing toolkit that we provide and that are often used for editing mammalian cells are usually Cas9 and Cas12a. These two enzymes have distinct mechanisms, structural requirements, and differing levels of specificity. SPCAS9 is the most frequently used Cas9 ortholog and is generally limited to targeting sequences with an NGG PAM site at the three prime end of an approximately 20 nucleotide protospacer sequence. Upon recognition of the target complementary to the guide RNA, Cas9 generates a predominantly blunt-ended double-strand break between the third and fourth base 5' prime of the PAM. Cas12a, on the other hand, is generally limited to targeting sites with a TTTV PAM at the 5' prime end of an approximately 21 to 24 nucleotide protospacer sequence used for targeting. Upon recognition, Cas12a generates a much more variable double-strand break by nicking both strands approximately four to five spaces apart towards the end of the protospacer sequence. Using either enzyme, a double-strand break is generated at a targeted location in the genome, which the cell now needs to repair. This is done using the cell's endogenous DNA repair pathways. The specific preferential outcomes here can really vary from cell type to cell type. Generally, however, two main mechanisms are leveraged by researchers to generate mutations in the resulting cell population. When no donor DNA uh, template is provided, the cell predominantly undergoes non-homologous end joining, which can generate variable insertions, deletions, and substitutions adjacent and overlapping the site of the double strand break. Alternatively, if a donor DNA template is provided with homology arms targeting the regions adjacent to the double strand break, shown here in blue, specific mutations can be incorporated into the resulting population of cells using the homology directed repair pathway. However, a key finding of CRISPR genome editing, like many other oligotherapeutics, is that the targeting of these enzymes is imperfect and may induce off-target unintended double-strand breaks at similar genomic loci. Here you can see the output of an empirical off-target nomination tool, GuideSeq, for a guide targeting the EMX1 gene. The number of reads in this workflow generally corresponds to the prevalence of these off-target editing events. Here you can see the on-target site with the most reads at the top and some of the identified off-target loci in the respective mismatches to the targeting sequence shown below. This is just one method for actually and nominating off-target sites, though. But the key takeaway here is that these off-target double-strand breaks occur, and identifying and quantifying their impact is important. 
Thus, selecting optimal guide RNA usually begins by selecting the best guides based on in silico predictions of on and off target editing efficiencies and verifying the guide's performance using a quick on target editing activity assay. This is then used to select the most efficient guides, which can have off target ed effects nominated using an empirical method, like Guide Seek or Change Seek. From here, editing can be quantified at on and off target sites simultaneously using a multiplexed PCR, which is possible using the ramp seek system that I'll discuss shortly. Here we can see just how important quantifying off target editing effects is for an AAVS1 targeting guide and 28 nominated off target loci that we evaluated in house under variable experimental conditions. Here you can see the percent editing quantified by NGS on the y-axis with each on or off target on the x-axis. Using a cell line with continuous expression of the Cas9 complex, we can observe a large amount of editing at the on target, but also highly prevalent editing at these 28 off target loci. By simply switching to ribonucleoprotein nucleofection, we can see that editing at these off target loci is greatly decreased. This really emphasizes the importance of optimizing the delivery mechanism of your CRISPR-Cas complex for highly specific editing. Furthermore, by switching to a highly specific CRISPR-Cas enzyme variant, like our Alt-R Hi-Fi Cas9, these off-target effects can be further reduced while maintaining efficient editing at the on-target site. We recently published the results on this Cas9 mutant in 2018. This all just shows how dramatic off-target editing effects can be, though, and how important quantification of both on- and off-target loci are in the process of optimizing a gene editing outcome. Now, when we talk about quantifying editing at on- and off-target loci, there are a number of methods that currently exist, with variable levels of features as depicted in this graphic. One fast and cheap method is to perform a heteroduplex assay using a mismatch endonuclease such as T71 or surveyor endonucleases. This method is fast and can be performed in high throughput, but is unreliable when it comes to quantification and provides no information on the allylic distribution of the edited cells. Here we can see results from previously published work where a known concentration of edited DNA was used to evaluate the accuracy of these methods. We can see here that T7E1 and surveyor systems quantification of editing efficiency is very approximate and only achieves rough quantification of this target when 30 to 50% of the DNA is edited. Additionally, T7E1 and surveyor systems can only quantify editing for one locus at a time. However, this is also highly dependent on the allelic diversity of the population of edited cells representing yet another caveat that can lead to inaccurate quantification of editing using this method. Sanger traces can also be used to approximate the editing efficiency and the allelic distribution at a site using analysis tools such as TIDE or ICE. Here we can see a graphic we adapted from Shapiro et al. that quantified the difference in editing efficiency using either NGS represented on the x-axis or Sanger methods on the y-axis for a number of sites. Although we can see here that Sanger deconvolution methods generally correlate well with NGS results, they consistently underrepresent the editing efficiency in a population of cells. Additionally, the resolution on allelic diversity has previously been reported to be low for Sanger assays, and we can see that as editing efficiency drops below 10% endo, these assays become erratic and unreliable. This is why we recommend that next-generation sequencing be used to quantify the effects of on- and off-target editing from CRISPR. Here we can see data derived from our recent preprint, where we evaluated the concentration of a titrated double-strand DNA mixture with a known concentration of indels in comparison to what is quantified using NGS. The values here correlate well with expectation down to 0.1% of observed indels, which is around the level of sequencing noise for this sample. NGS is the gold standard for this process since it has high resolution of allelic variant distribution in the population and can be high throughput by simultaneously quantifying on and off target editing effects using a multiplex PCR reaction. 
One caveat here, however, is that NGS analysis is dependent on bioinformatics software, which requires validation for accuracy. Additionally, sometimes even just having access to personnel with bioinformatics expertise is a significant barrier. This is a major issue that I'll show you how we solve with the RAMPC CRISPR analysis system. So the RAMPC CRISPR analysis system is a new end-to-end -end workflow that we developed to help researchers quantify the effects of on- and off-target editing using NGS. This includes developing RH primers for multiplex PCR using our RAMPSeq design tool, preparing the Amplicon library using the corresponding master mix, and analyzing the sequencing data produced from an Illumina MySeq in an easy-to-use web platform. You can find more information on any of these components at the link below. Let's start, though, by looking at what exactly the RAMPSeq chemistry is and how primers can be designed to interrogate editing effects using this system. So I've said it a few times now, but what is RAMPSeq? RAMPSeq is a method we created for highly specific and multiplexable generation of NGS-ready amplicons using RHPCR. RHPCR is an amplification method that uses primers containing an RNA base and a blocking group at the three prime end of the primer that can be cleaved by RNase H2 when the primer anneals to the intended region. Upon cleavage of the blocking group, amplification via PCR can proceed as usual to create an amplicon with universal adapters, which can be used to append P7 and P5 sequencing adapters via a second PCR to create NGS-ready amplicons. The use of RAMPSeq enables highly specific targeting using primers, which allows for the creation of highly multiplex panels, all with only a few hours of hands-on time in our experience. Additionally, we help design these primers in an easily automated fashion using our, uh, with our RAMPSeq design tool. The design process starts by just using our RAMPSeq design tool. Here you can submit your guide locations using either BED or FASTA files as input. You can see an example of what a BED coordinate looks like below. They generally just consist of basic target information like the chromosome, start location, stop location, and strand information for your guide. And this can be easily uploaded as a file or copy-pasted directly into the interface. We also developed a CRISPR gene editing specific design strategy here which can be selected by clicking the CRISPR Gene Editing Analysis button under the Application Interface option. This was implemented to make sure that amplicons that are designed using our tool will become capable of characterizing indel events that are typically representative of CRISPR editing. Additionally, you can configure parameters here to select different supported reference genomes and decide whether primers should be pooled into a single reaction or designed as a series of singleton assays using the Pool Design button. After submission, under the hood, this tool is taking all of the guide targets that are provided and performing an exhaustive primer design around each target site. After this, an in silico primer QC step is performed that helps to rank the efficiency of the different assays. The selected decision to pool or not pool the designed assays then influences the sequential step. For applications such as simultaneous evaluation of on- and off-target editing, it is desirable to pool as many compatible assays as possible into a single primer pool for workflow simplicity. Here you can see the exhaustively designed primaries that are then QC'd for multiplex compatibility and then a selection strategy takes place to attempt to maximize the number of primers in a single pool that are still of high quality. It's possible to get up to 5,000 primers into a single pooled reaction during this process. In the new non-pooled method that we have added, the multiplex PCR primer pooling step is skipped. Thus, the best assay is just selected for each guide or set of guides that can be captured in a single amplicon. This is useful for people who have a need for high-throughput singleplex assay design and amplification, such as those that have a genome-wide guide RNA library that they need to design NGS assays around. This batch design of singleplex primers is then made available in a plate format for easy implementation in, in high-throughput workflows. 
Once primers are designed, the next step in this workflow is to amplify edited gDNA and create NGS libraries using the RAMPSeq library preparation kit. For those doing single-plex amplification for applications such as design and analysis of editing from guide RNA libraries, the current interface allows an easy design of RAMPSeq assays to correspond to your number of guides. As stated before, guide locations are used as input to design assays capable of capturing editing events for each guide specified such that you could have an equal number of assays as guides put into the tool. To compare our workflows, against, uh, our workflows features against other publicly available tools, we did an internal study designing and preparing NGS libraries with other widely available technologies, such as Primer 3 and an alternative master mix. We can see that we achieve a higher design success rate than Primer 3 in this internally generated, exa generated example, where we designed assays for 96 different guide RNAs. We also have the ability to multiplex and batch design these assays. Once you have your primers, GDNA can be amplified using the RAMPSeq master mix, which comes with analysis credits to analyze your NGS data downstream. We did a comparison between the assays prepared using the RAMSeq design tool and Primer 3 design tool, both with and without the RAMSeq master mix. Here we can see that the target amplification success rate is higher with the RAMSeq master mix using RAMSeq primer designs compared to Primer 3 designs with a competitor master mix for 96 targets designed for single plex amplification. Additionally, we demonstrate that the RAMPSeq master mix can even be easily used without ramp primers for efficient amplification of singleton assays with better performance compared to another master mix. For reference, the differences between DNA only and ramp primers are shown below. Differences are just the RNA base and the blocking group discussed in the prior slide. Finally, we can take the NGS-ready Amplicon library and sequence it with an Illumina MySeq and analyze using our RAMPSeq CRISPR analysis tool utilizing the CRISP alteration software. This is part of work that we currently have available on BioArchives if you want more information. However, we can see that indels quantified by both Primer 3 designed and RAMPSeq designed libraries are highly concordant demonstrating that RAMPSeq can be used as a plug-and-play method for generating NGS libraries while gaining credits to do NGS analysis. For users doing on- and off-target quantification, RAMPSeq helps to reduce the probability of primer dimer formation compared to DNA-only primers, as can be seen on the gel on the left. Additionally, the design algorithm helps to generate amplicons that will give high uniformity and read depth coverage for the targets designed. Here on the right, we can see an example of a pool with 990 assays in a single reaction with greater than 91% of the sites amplified having a coverage greater than 0.2x mean coverage. As mentioned, the RAMSeq master mix now comes with credits to do NGS analysis after sequencing. The software for doing this analysis is specifically designed to be user-friendly and not rely on local computational resources. Again, if you want more information about the specifics of this NGS analysis workflow, you can find it in our BioArchive publication shown below. So you may be asking, why did we create our own CRISPR NGS analysis software? Doesn't software already exist for this? And the short answer here is yes. But based on our own findings and surveyed feedback, it doesn't really satisfy all end user needs. These tools currently consist of software like Crispresso, Crispresso 2, and Amplicam. But we found a number of customers struggling with these tools. For example, the tools can be difficult to use for those without bioinformatics expertise. The software accuracy is not fully characterized or validated. And the existing user interfaces for the software cannot support high throughput workflows. For this reason, we created our own tool by performing a number of CAS9 and CAS12A editing experiments and characterizing the resulting indel profiles of these experiments. We use this to create a biologically informed, thoroughly verified software package for CRISPR genome editing with an easy-to-use web interface. Here you can see how our tool in green outperforms other tools in annotating editing efficiency using an internally created in silico benchmarking data set with a known amount of indels represented as a black horizontal line. 
This web platform was designed in a partnership with Bluebee, now an Illumina company, to help provide a secure, widely accessible platform that would enable high-throughput biology. The platform is GDPR compliant, deployed in the cloud, and has a number of features, including automatic file streaming and batch submission. From a high level, the analysis workflow is as follows. You first upload using either a drag and drop interface or by picking a folder on your hardware that can be used to stream files into the interface. Next, you select your uploaded samples and provide guide and amplicon information to start an analysis run. Lastly, you can interpret the results of an individual or aggregated experiment directly in the interface to quantify important metrics like editing efficiency, HDR repair frequency, frame shift frequency, the population of alleles, and more. For those doing DOE experiments, optimizing experimental conditions, or evaluating the performance of CRISPR libraries, we implemented graphics to enable easy selection of ideal experimental conditions or functional guides. You can quickly screen a 96 or 384 well plate of conditions and analyze using the analysis tool. Here you can see an example where we had an unedited control, two treatments, and two HDR donors being evaluated for three different guides. You can quickly see that if the optimal condition is to repair the double strand break using the HDR pathway with a minimal amount of frame shift and mutation, treatment two with HDR donor one for guide three is the most optimal condition. From here, you could nominate off targets under this condition and create a multiplex assay using the RampSeq design tool to assess off targets. If you should need help while using the tool, we also have resources for this as well. Help FAQs can be accessed by selecting the question mark icon in the top right corner. You can see an example of the definition of several metrics shown here in this example. Additionally, if your answer can't be found in this documentation, it is easy to find additional help by pressing the Lifesaver button in the top right corner. This navigates you to a form that you can fill out to request help from our application support team. You can also let us know of any features that you would like to request in future versions of the tool here. All these components make up the RAMPSEQ CRISPR analysis system, and as a part of this effort, we also characterize performance of this system on an internal data sets to help provide experimental recommendations. For starters, we wanted to look into the number of reads that should be obtained to quantify editing with confidence at a target site. We looked at a panel of 91 targets that were edited under variable experimental conditions, quantified editing with the reads uh, generated using CRISP alterations, and then subsampled the reads for each targeting triplicate and calculated the deviation of indels quantified with the subsampled reads against when all of the reads were used. Here on the left, we can see the magnitude of indel fold change decreasing significantly as read depth approaches around 1,000 paired end reads from a 2x150 Illumina MySeq run. From looking at the standard deviation of triplicates divided by the unsubsampled indel frequency, it appears that approximately 0.5% indels can be annotated with a deviation only around plus or minus 0.2% indels. Thus, for most applications, we recommend at least 1,000 paired end uh, reads should be obtained for quantification of editing, although this is really subject to change based on end user applications. Next, we quantified the level of background indel rates we observe in unedited samples to get an idea of what background noise looks like when using the Ramsey CRISPR analysis system. We did this with 273 unique loci with greater than 10,000 reads and two cell lines. Here on the x-axis, you can see the percent indels in control samples binned in 0.1% intervals with the relative frequency of all control samples plotted on the y-axis. Here we find that approximately 98% of genomic sites we looked at have an indel signal below 0.4% indels, and thus proceeded to use this to create an assumption that most samples should have an indel noise somewhere between 0 and 0.4%. Finally, we wanted to see how sensitive the Ramsey CRISPR analysis system may be for quantifying low levels of off-target editing. 
We thus created a truth set with variable levels of indel spiked into 20 unedited genomic loci with background indel frequencies in our expected range between 0 and 0.4%. This enabled us to create a set of paired treatment and control sets that could be ca uh, categorized as true positive when a control sample was compared to a treated sample or a true negative when a control sample was compared to another control. To provide a binary call if a sample was edited or not at a, at a target site, we performed a Fisher's exact test on the paired samples at the same site, comparing the read count of wild type and indel containing reads for the assigned treatment versus control. This allowed us to generate a p-value, which we used as a threshold to qualify anything with less than 0.05 as a truly edited target site. Here you can see that with about 47 to 56 pairs per indel dilution level, we are able to char correctly characterize 95% of true positives down to 0.5% indels in this data set, while correctly characterizing true negatives also approximately 95% of the time. A key requirement of this, though, is that this was performed with at least 5,000 reads per target, paired treatment and control, and background indel levels in that suggested level I talked about, less than 0.4%. From all this, we can conclude that the ramp CRISPR analysis system can really help bring you from a set of nominated off-target sites to annotated levels of indel editing with no bioinformatics experience needed. Additionally, this can be done with higher accuracy than other available tools and in high throughput. All of this can be done for on-off target workflows or even those that need to analyze on-target editing effects in high throughput, such as when analyzing results from a DOE experiment. As a part of this work, there really are a ton of people that need to be thanked. Several of them are pictured here, but at a high level, there are a lot of people to thank from both the IDT and Bluebe slash Illumina team to make this all, all this work possible. Additionally, while we were developing the NGS analysis interface, we had a ton of amazing customers and collaborators that I need to thank that were willing to test and give us feedback on early versions of the product. Their feedback was really crucial and helped to ultimately turn this into a better product. Lastly, if you want more general information about RAMPSEQ and its applications, please feel free to follow this link. And with that, I'd just like to say thanks for tuning into this webinar, and I'll take any questions the audience may have. Thank you, Gavin, for your very informative presentation. Um, we have received several questions from our audience, so we'll see um, how many we can get through here. The, the first question is, what CRISPR enzymes are supported by the RAMPSEQ CRISPR analysis tool? Yeah, that's a good question. So right now, uh, the work we've done uh, is, has shown that we're supporting, you know, Amplicon next generation sequencing data from CAS9 and CAS12A CRISPR experiments. Uh, the tool also has the ability to support CAS9 NICase as well in the current state. Great, thank you. The next question is, how many analysis credits are used for each RAMPSEQ CRISPR analysis tool data analysis run? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so uh, the number of analysis credits here really depends on the number of samples in the run. Uh, like I said, you can submit a, a batch of samples technically. So, you know, if you submitted a batch, it would be more than one sample or one more than one credit for the entire batch. Um, each sample that you run requires one analysis credit. And here a sample is defined as a pair of read one and read two fast two files that are turned into a single sample. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, what is your recommended sequencing depth to quantify CRISPR editing? Yeah, so this is a, a, a tricky question, I would say. Uh, so I, I would at this point, you know, say for most applications, a target coverage of 1,000 paired end reads per amplicon, uh, like we showed, is recommended to accurately quantify CRISPR editing. Although depending on how confident you really want to be and, you know, um, uh, what your goals are, that, that number can really vary. 
uh, from case to case or end user to end user. Okay, thanks, Gavin. Uh, the next question we have is, what is the default window size that this tool uses? And if you want to change that window size, is that possible? Yeah, so, uh, and I didn't touch too much about this in the actual talk, but the way these usually work is, uh, these types of tools, is that they set the, the CRISPR cut site, and they basically annotate variants flanking this cut site out to, you know, X bases where, you know, you would expect editing events to occur. And we do a, a deep dive into what, you know, actually, you know, uh, something that looks like real CRISPR editing um, in our publication that's on BioArchives right now. But for right now, we've determined that the optimal window size is eight base pairs for CAS9 and nine for CAS12a. So when you run an analysis with the default window size, uh, that's what it's using. Um, however, you can change the actual window size in the interface. Um, you just need to configure that parameter in the run for that sample. So. Okay, great, good to know. Um, the next question is, what sequencing data formats are accepted? Yeah, so right now we do require that the, um, the, the inputs to the tool be uh, FASTQ or gzipped FASTQ, FASTQ.gz. Um, I would generally recommend a .fastq.gz just because it's a lot faster to actually upload, whether you're streaming or dragging it directly into the interface. Um, but we do require that these files have already been demultiplexed, and this is usually a, a pretty standard thing that uh, most sequencing providers will do for you. Okay. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, what organisms can be analyzed using the RAMP-seq CRISPR analysis tool? Yeah, so um, it, it kind of depends on what analysis mode you're doing. There's a singleplex analysis and a multiplex analysis. Um, singleplex, you're providing the guide and amplicon sequence directly to the tool. So theoretically, you can use, you know, uh, this sequence could be, you know, independent of any sort of genome. However, when we're talking about a multiplex analysis where we're simultaneously quantifying editing at on and off target loci, um, this is only supported in the current interface with a number of genomes. Um, that being human, both the HG38 and HG19 build, um, mouse, C. Uh, elegans, a roundworm, rat, zebrafish, um, and two different monkeys. We've got the rhesus monkey and the crab-eating monkey in the uh, interface currently supported. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and that's the, all the time we have for questions, but uh, we will contact you directly if you asked a question and we didn't get a chance to answer it here today. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Kurgan for his time with us today. And lastly, thank all of you again for attending and we wish you the best of success in your research.